Well, my name is John Santoff. I'm the founder and CTO of a company called PulseLink. We're one of the early pioneers of ultra-wideband technology, and we're one of the first ones to come to market with um, what had been previously a classified military technology, and we're commercializing it, and we're bringing it into the home today. That's cool, could you describe, <laughs> I love how it's classified. Could you describe a little bit what UWB is? Ultra-wideband is a fundamentally different way of utilizing radio spectrum. In, in the past, the way that we've used, utilized radio spectrum, there's been a specific frequency assignment, like if you were doing 802.11, it was 2.4 gigahertz, or your, as if you had your cordless phone, it was 900 megahertz, cell phones, whatever. We don't use a frequency assignment. We basically radiate across gigahertz of spectrum simultaneously, and essentially the energy is spread out in the frequency domain to where we're down and, and just perceived as noise as far as everything else is concerned. But when you look at it in the time domain, we're basically sub-nanoseconds, uh, under a billionth of a second as our energy's being spread. And so it's, it's a, it's a was really a very unique way of utilizing radio frequency spectrum. As a matter of fact, it took three or four years of lobbying the FCC to get regulatory approval because they really didn't understand what to do with it. They never had to deal with anything like it before. Well, you know, it, it, with current radio, you know, I'll use Wi-Fi as an example. Current uh, Wi-Fi and my 2.4 gigahertz phone slam into each other. Yes. You know, am I going to have the same issue here? I mean, if you're using that much of the spectrum, is this going to interfere with other devices? No, because it, when you start looking in the frequency domain, we're putting nanowatts in at any particular megahertz. It's only when you take all that energy that's been spread over, say, a gigahertz and a half of spectrum and you clump it all back together again, you get an appreciable amount of energy. But as far as any individual operator of spectrum within there, we're just uncorrelated noise. So what kind of range and bandwidth can I expect from something like this? Well, you know, um, based off of the FCC's um, regulatory limits on it, it's been, been very conservative. And basically it's a pan technology, 30, 40, 50 feet. But that's not a limitation of the technology, that's a limitation of the regulatory limits that the FCC's imposed on it. You know, actually, um, we're actually a throwback to Marconi, which was the actual original spark gap 100 years ago, um, but we're, think of it as, as, as um, Morse code, but, but very, very fast Morse code at billions of, of, of taps per second. And, um, but we basically have taken what was the original form of um, radio communications 100 years ago from Marconi, and um, I've updated it for the, you know, for the 21st century. Well, let's eliminate the FCC for a moment, and let, let's just talk, let's say, let's get it out of the U.S. and put it into a country that doesn't re regulate at all. For, this is my, my pretend country. Okay. Uh, how, theoretically, how fast, how far could it go? Well, what happens is we have to trade bandwidth for range with ultra-wideband. So every time we double our range, we quarter our data rate. Now, we may actually start with a gigabit data rate at, say, two meters or whatever. But then by the time that you go out to, to four meters, you know, you start dropping down, you know, and, and as you go out. So we can go out miles with this. However, by the time you go out to miles, you're going to be down to single digit megabit data rates, which is still actually better than a cell phone. Cell, cell phones are doing tens of kilobits. Well, you know, it's, it's, you know, if you're talking megabits, it's still a T1 line. At yes, that point. absolutely. So let's talk about, you've got the wireless solution that you're showing here in your booth, also a coaxial wired solution as well. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, what we're doing here is we're using TDMA access, time division multiple access, so we're, we're able to, um, to, to use the same media, the same frequency, and we just chop it up into little um, sections of time. So what we do is, is on, on the coax right here, is we'll use one frame of, of time to send data one direction, and then we'll use the next frame to send it the other direction, so we can simultaneously um, or near simultaneously, be sending data bi-directionally on this. And, and because we're using TDMA, it's very deterministic. We know exactly where we're going to send it. There's no contention for the, for the medium. Like when you're using 802.11, or even 802.3 Ethernet, it's a contention-based type of access scheme. So it's really very difficult to guarantee a quality of service. By using TDMA, we guarantee time slots. So we can do um, guaranteed quality of service deterministically. So, uh, one of the cool applications of this, and I'm going to kind of speak on, on what one of the areas that really is harming or hurting us, is that you know, we shoot all this high def video, we're doing 1080p at the show floor, we get it into the home, and now it's stuck on the computer. Yes. So, you've got a solution that takes it and allows me to take it from the computer to the high def screens and sling it all around my house. Absolutely, that's, that's the whole idea of what we're doing with C-Wave. That's very cool. Yes, so basically, the same chipset has been engineered because it's ultra wideband, which has some very unique characteristics to it. We can use the same chipset for wireless, for coax, and later on this year you'll be seeing demonstrations publicly of power line and also over twisted copper pair. Today we're focused on the coax and the wireless. So basically, since we use the same chipset, 
wherever you terminate your coax connection, it could also be a wireless access point as well because we can retransmit that same data to wireless devices within the room. So I could have a wired connection and then also all these termination, uh, terminated boxes are wireless boxes and all of these can be slinging the same high def content back and forth from my, uh, from my central media store. Absolutely, and when, when you have the amount of bandwidth that we have, we, we have a lot of bandwidth to do this with. We have, we have bandwidth to spare so we can throw a lot of other stuff on there. Incidentally, what you're seeing here today is DLNA based off of Ethernet streaming 1080p content one direction and then we're using 1394 HANA which is Home, um, Home Audio Video Networking Alliance 1394 and we're sending that the other direction. So what you're actually seeing here is coexistence of both Ethernet and 1394 traffic on the same media going two different directions at the same time. Now you seem to know a whole lot about this. Uh, tell me a little bit about your background. I mean, clearly you're not just a regular PR guy. That's no, no, no. I, I originally, I spent 10 years active duty in the military. I worked with ultra wideband technology back when it was a classified technology. Back in 85 and 86, I was, I was over in Germany on a hilltop and um, I could go into that, but that's a long story in itself. But basically, I understood the capabilities of ultra wideband. And as I saw other companies starting to move into the space and do some, um, some military projects with um, handheld radios, squad radios, I started realizing what the um, actual opportunity that was available for the consumer electronics industry. So I formed a company, I'm actually the founder of the company, and um, we started taking this technology from the military domain into the consumer domain. And we started doing that over five years ago, it's taken that long.